orbiting in the back. Oh, 30? Yeah, okay. You work last night? All right, our last me lecture of the semester uh, on Friday will be April. And just again, as an introduction to April, she, Travis Stiles, and I, we all did our undergrads together. And Travis and I both came here for our masters and then opposite coasts for, for our PhDs. And April went into her DPT, and, but three very different careers. Um, so she went into clinical practice that really lets apply stuff. So the idea of this class applied in clinical physiology, she's full application uh, as a neural uh, physical therapist. And Travis went into the bench science, uh, pharmacology, drug compounding, uh, chemistry route. And then I went into this. Like, this is this is my my direction. So uh, for the last me day, uh, we'll finish up the brain and exercise. Uh, you know, I've been talking about the brain and exercise for a long time, but now you guys know Lord of the Rings, right? More blameless bread, right? We have more exercise uh, today. And then we'll very briefly talk about nootropics as they wear the exact same outfit that I'm wearing here. Uh, we'll, at, the, at the end, we'll talk about nootropics, the, the supplements, the stuff you can take that will uh, facilitate some sort of cognition or neuroprotection, brain health, something like that. Yeah, apparently it's at least not going to work. Sorry, uh, but uh, you know the points and where to find everything. There will be one case study for the final, and I think you can guess what it is based on what we've been talking about. I haven't written it yet, but the content, the topic, um, I know is going to be. Uh, you, you already know what it is. Right? It's going to be some sort of brain health thing. Now, just echoing what we talked about on Monday, I guess it was, the brain receives blood. It has to. If the brain receives less blood, that is acutely problematic. And it if it receives a lot less blood, that is death. Right? So we're going to manage cerebral blood. We have those four vessels. Uh, doing it. And the carotids and your vertebral arteries, uh, a pair of each of them. But there's a lot of stuff he's regulating. Once upon a time, it was thought that this was very consistent. No matter what state you're in, you're lounging, you are riding the recumbent bike, you are whatever it is you're doing, it's constant uh, blood flow to the brain. And that's not true. Uh, it turns out that a lot of things affect it. Lots of stuff affects the amount of blood flow going to the brain and uh, during exercise, you can increase that during moderate exercise though, really high intensity, you know, get up to 80% of your VO2 max, something like that. You're gonna see uh, cerebral blood flow going down a little bit, meeting those oxygen and glucose demands uh, by other means, but you can't deal with nerves, neurons, don't do well with ischemia. And those are just four blood vessels in a person um, it's pretty well distributed, it seems to be pretty well distributed, getting blood flow to the brain uh, through those four. Now remember, at, as you increase the intensity, the metabolic need for oxygen increases. And how do you meet that? At submaximal intensity, moderate intensity, you're gonna increase the amount of cerebral blood, flow, the amount of actual blood being set there. At higher intensities, you don't have that effect. And so the, AVO2 difference, the amount of oxygen you're taking out of those arteries um, and that it is not returning in the veins. So this is what it looks like with the amount of blood flow and the intensity. Here it is at rest and a uh, percentage uh, of VO2 max, a uh, percentage, think percentage of intensity. Um, as, as you get right to that middle zone, you're increasing it, you're gonna have a higher a cerebral blood flow, a higher amount of blood. And then it goes down as intensity reaches just outright max. You're receiving less cerebral blood flow. And it recovers, kind of comes back to the rest, but it doesn't deplete so much that, that it becomes a problem. 
it can be a mechanism of fatigue. Depleted cerebral blood flow can be a mechanism of fatigue, but your, your brain, your central nervous system will shut you down before any harm is done. Now remember glucose, that's what these neurons, the central nervous system, it just runs off glucose, but during glucose and ketones, and during exercise, it takes up a lot of lactate to use as fuel. So lactate is a major energy source. And remember that we do regrow nerves. We just don't do it well. In the central nervous system, we do it very poorly. It does happen, but it doesn't happen in abundance like you would see in the peripheral nervous system. Um, and so the hippocampus is this, is this region for memory consolidation. Let's hold on to some memories for a minute and just see, let's, let's, let's sit on them and see if they're important, see if we need to log those into something uh, more, more permanent. And so that's what a lot of the work is looking at is the hippocampus in neuro uh, generation. And the first associ uh, association with BDNF and exercise, just mice and rats for, for a long time. And eventually we get to people, uh, was this, so 1995, it's not that old, uh, this is a relatively uh, recent field of study is brain derived neurotrophic factor, these factors, BEGF, IGF, uh, BDNF, and uh, increasing their gene expression with exercise is demonstrated very reliably every single time they're running these studies. And there's those couple of, of mouse models. Remember, they'll divide them into four groups, um, whether it's uh, exercise and sedentary, young and old, or exercise and sedentary with a BDNF block. And then they do this experiment, right? They throw them in the, in the vats, they throw them in the water, they swim around, you try to find that platform. And the platform's in the same space every time, time after time. You put them somewhere else in that vat, somewhere else in their little mouse pool. And it's you know, opaque water, they, they, they can't see the platform, but they'll remember where it is. The exercising mice remember where it is. And then you trick them by removing that platform. And the exercisers just swim around where they, where they knew it should be. I know it's here, right? That's a mouse who has learned. And in this trial, um, the old runners, you know, the wheel runners, the old ones uh, seemed to be more cognitively uh, intact, uh, uh, malleable, able to learn than the young sedentary mice. So exercise is a way of reversing cognitive age. What cognitive decline would ordinarily look like throughout the lifespan is not just slowed, but it can be reversed in, in old exercisers. Now, young exercisers respond even more. The young exercisers get an even more robust response. And this is just the other one. Uh, that was the exact same study, except they were doing BDNF blockers. Um, and so it wasn't young or old, it was, uh, we have exercisers and non-exercisers, and we have uh, BDNF blockers and a control. Same basic experiment. And BDNF was so critical to learning that if you block BDNF, you impair their ability to actually learn. So this is the exercise control group. Everything else looks sedentary. Exercise with a BDNF blocker, uh, for this particular outcome, it looks sedentary. That doesn't mean if you take a BDNF blocker that every single effective exercise is null. You still get this robust response from exercise in a number of domains, but certain domains are massively regulated by BDNF. BDNF is a mechanism for that enhancement. And so if you block BDNF, you block that ability. And in people, remember, you can't do these experiments and just be too unethical. So you can't put a BDNF blocker in a person and go, oh, look at how bad your brain works now. Uh, but there are uh, genetic abnormalities. And in these abnormalities, you do see, among other things, like metabolic complications, you do see cognitive uh, impairments. Uh, that's a really good question, and it's one for which I don't have a good answer to. There are, 
this is this is a non-answer, but it's commentary, it's peripheral commentary to your question. There are alleles that make it work not quite as well. And so like a third of people, you know, so and you you can see slight differences uh, in cognition uh, at the genetic level of, of these these relatively innocuous alleles that are abundant uh, in, in populations. Uh, so what is some critical minimum, though? I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, you have to have an amount of it. Uh, and what is that amount? I'm not sure. Uh, but participation exercise, so many studies. If you just go exercise and you have dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, some sort of cognitive decline, uh, the effects of that exercise are they really slow the, the deterioration and they reverse some of it and acute mental functioning uh, can be better. Same with, this, uh, with some of these nootropics. Uh, lots of effects though. Exercise does a ton of things. Exercise does a ton of things. We're focusing on uh, BDNF and a little bit of IGF, VEGF. We're focusing on, on particular factors, but exercise has very broad effects uh, on the brain and mechanisms. I, I uploaded a paper for this uh, lecture. You'll see it later today when I, when I actually upload it. Uh, that talks about a lot of the mechanisms of exercise. We don't need to go through. It was like a 30 page paper with 15 pages of references about the mechanisms. We don't need to go through that. But there's a couple of myokines that get released. Remember muscle, you go exercise. And, and by the way, BDNF isn't like only exclusively made in the brain. You know, brain derived neurotrophic factor. That's when we discover things. When a person discovers something, uh, they clean it just like prostaglandins, right? It's not like the prostate gland is responsible for all the prostaglandins, right? This is everywhere. Um, you know, any, any cell in the body, um, you're going to have some arachidonic acid. You have a phospholipid bilayer. Uh, but, you know, where you discover these things determines its nomenclature. Um, LKB1 is another one. Liver kinase B1. That's not a liver enzyme. Yes, it's very abundant in the liver, but it's ubiquitous. Same thing with BDNF muscle makes it lots of stuff. Uh, but muscle during exercise, you're going to, you know, just 600 myokines, you're going to release these cytokines, little signaling proteins are going to be released. And some of them cause an increase in BDNF. Some of these myokines cause an increase in BDNF. It's not the only thing they do. Just like any pharmacist will tell you, every drug has a lot of effects, a lot of interactions. Same thing with these cytokines, these myokines. There are a lot of effects that they have. Uh, but some of them do stimulate uh, BDNF. Now, we'll talk a lot more about this topic today, about exercise and the, the state of evidence about how to employ it, what to do with our exercise, what prescriptions we should be giving people if it's a cognitive goal, right? If they are, if it's an older, let's say it's like a 75 year old and they want to keep being an attorney and like, well, you better be sharp, you know, or you want to keep being a whatever, a professor or whatever, you better be able to use your head. So why don't we get you on the treadmill? Why don't we get you on an obstacle course? We'll talk about that later. But this one, if you're a student studying and you're trying to retain information, you're trying to learn information faster and retain it better, uh, what they found is just a couple of sprints a couple of three minute uh, exertions was sufficient to learn considerably faster, maybe 20% faster, and retain uh, what was learned significantly by comparison to the control group for eight months. And they didn't measure them between eight and 10 months is when people came back and they didn't measure them like three years later. And so all, all we can say is that for a lot of months, you will learn stuff better, retain stuff better. You will retain what you learn. You're not gonna learn five months after your single bout of exercise. But you, immediately following your exercise, uh, you will learn faster and retain that information for much longer after six minutes of exercise. And so it's a very effective 
uh, addition to a study um, protocol, however you're trying to do it. Uh, and so the intense, the intensity, and we'll talk more about that later, intensity and duration and then the effect of these things. But intensity is what really mattered. The high epinephrine group, that's after a week, come back and, and you know, all these made up words. You know, and you have to, it was a study in German, but uh, all, these, all these made up words, eight months later, eight to 10 months later, people are remembering them better based on did your epinephrine go up? Now that's a correlation. Um, and how much of epinephrine is causing retention? Who knows? There's a correlation of, of epinephrine. Epinephrine also associates with, you're gonna have that same situation, you're gonna get more BDNF, that same situation is going to elicit other neurochemical outcomes too. Uh, and just putting it into practice of just sort of an epidemiological bird's eye view uh, in, in Naperville in Illinois, just outside of Chicago, uh, remember that zero hour PE where this guy, you know what, we're gonna have everybody exercise maximally, aerobic, but aerobic. Yeah, how aerobic is it? full sprints for you know seven minutes or whatever there's a huge aerobic component but um the intensity was there you better cross that finish line at your maximum heart rate your age predicted maximum heart rate and your little kids so it's really high uh and then go to first period and let's see how you do just like those uh study participants who exercise for six minutes and then learn stuff way better so did those students and then they went to go compete in the teams um, the international every every four years, fourth graders and eighth graders. This was the eighth graders in this case, uh, and they ended up number one in the world in science, in in a country in which we also had last place. So, so we had we had districts that came in first place in the world and last place in the world. And it's important to look at what we're doing in the curriculum. Look at what we're doing with our, our behavior, and because it's, it's not a genetic difference. Number one in the world, number. What, however many you know billion people there are in the world like that, those are the two anchors and like, well, let's let's evaluate behavior because this is controllable it's not a genetic thing um and just this idea that we move because we have brains immobile creatures don't have central nervous system brains exist for motion for movement we can't just bask in the sun and absorb the rays and uh, be satisfied with our nutrition, right? We have to go acquire our food. We have to swat away our predators or flee from them or fight them or, or whatever. Food acquisition and safety and reproduction, all of these things require movement and movement requires a brain. If you use your body for movement, your brain works better. Use your, use your brain really for what it exists, the, the reason it exists, use it for that reason. Okay, let's get into some prescriptions. So what you would say to a patient or a client or a subject or a grandparent or a sibling or oneself, right? If you want to use some of this information to make modifications to your own exercise, there's acute bouts of exercise and then there are chronic uh, exercise conditions. And these are different. These affect us differently. Uh, so for the chronic <laughs> exercise, this is this is more effective. Acute is helpful. Acute can assist in learning or function. Uh, chronic exercise is where we get all these structural changes. Um, so a single bout of exercise, and you can get BDNF, you can get BEGF. Um, IGF depending, the, the research is a little bit scattered uh, with IGF. But accumulated bounce of exercise, just like there's, you know, everybody's different in terms of your response, but post-exercise hypotension. Some people will go exercise and they'll have a period where their blood pressure dips. Their blood pressure is lower following exercise. And if you look up like Garrett Ash, um, hand grip, just do hand grip, um, exercise and then watch your blood pressure fall for a while. And so you don't have to do that much to get post exercise hypotension. Again, on a case by case basis, it depends on the individual. We're all people, we're all individuals. Genetically, we're going to respond to these things differently. But 
post-exercise hypotension, when people say, like, exercise reduces blood pressure by four to nine millimeters of mercury, you know that's a little bit uh, silly. The Claude Bouchard uh, study that showed just the range of responses that we have. Nobody's really, that's the mean, and, and nobody in the room is ever quite the mean. But it's possible that the chronic effect with blood pressure is the accumulated effect of a lot of post exercise hypotension. And so, ruling out the acute effects, um, extracting it from the, from the chronic, that's hard. They're sort of indissoluble, those two, the, the acute and the chronic. But accumulated bouts here, where you get BDNF release over and over and over, that is the impetus. That's, the, that's what um, creates these structural changes. Now, people who have a history of exercise, people who have exercised a lot in the past, and people who are in better shape, which means you've exercised a lot in the past, really. Those two are, are pretty connected. What's your VO2 max? Oh, it's high. You probably exercise. There's variation, but you probably exercise. Um, so people with a higher VO2 max are getting a, a more pronounced BDNF response. The better shape you're in, the better this works. The more training you have done in the past, the better this works. If all you do is take all the same people and have them exercise on day one and have them exercise on day 40, keep exercising, measure them on day 40, uh, you'll see a more pronounced BDNF response with chronic exercise. So this is a trainable uh, effect. And neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, both of these happen with chronic exercise. These aren't really acute exercise phenomena, these are chronic, but neurogenesis, let's make some new neurons. Um, BDNF, IGF, and VEGF, all three of those are involved in neurogenesis. Synaptogenesis, let's create new synapses, right? Uh, that one, BDNF and IGF are, are really driving them. They're responsible for those adaptations. From the state of evidence, from, from what we know now, uh, BDNF and IGF are driving that. Angiogenesis, let's add in VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. And let's get some new vascular networks available so that, that um, so the brain, the, the neural tissue can receive more blood. Um, but BDNF is uh, partly mediating that as well. BDNF and vascular endothelial growth factor are doing angiogenesis, but all three of those. And let's add in gliogenesis. Um, all four of these are uh, the response of chronic exercise. This doesn't happen with a single bout. It's, you're not going to get all this with a single bout. Your brain works better after a single bout, but it doesn't restructure itself. It functions better, but the architecture doesn't change. So long-term effects. We're seeing increase in BDNF, increase in VEGF, increase in IGF. Um, gliogenesis, neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, and geogenesis. And just where these arrows go, these little numbers kind of along the way, those are just citations. Again, this article, you'll see it later today if you care to look. Um, you don't have to go look at it, but if you're interested in the subject, you can always pull this up. Um, so BDNF does all four of those. BDNF is so critical for so many uh, adaptations. Uh, VEGF, contributes to neurogenesis and really to angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is contributing to cerebral blood flow. Um, and then IGF is contributing to those three. Yeah, it doesn't really seem to have as much of a role in angiogenesis though. Uh, this is white matter volume, WMV, white matter volume, GMV, uh, gray matter volume. So gray matter, that's your actual processing. That's the uh, neural bodies and dendrites and, and um, the axons, that's your white myelinated, that's the axons are white. So the actual volume of your brain, of gray matter and white matter, um, those seem to be going up. Now these dotted lines mean um, the evidence isn't quite as, as solid uh, for those. This is the evidence hints, the evidence indicates, the evidence supports. This is like, there's a ton of evidence up here. And here we have, we have um, indications of all those effects. But the consequence of increasing receptor activity, increasing neural activity, increasing the actual volume 
right? The consequence of that is better function. Your brain works better if you restructure, if you improve the architecture of your brain. Now, where you see a gray matter volume, where you see white matter volume throughout the brain, the gray matter, oh, that you're just you're getting increases now throughout the brain. Um, the, the asterisk, there, there's a couple of those. Um, these have been associated also with uh, performance, cognitive performance. Uh, not just, oh, we have measured architectural changes or observed uh, an, an effect. This is, we have also tested cognitive functioning and, and observed a uh, uh, consequence uh, of, of good effects. These X's, this just means inconclusive. That's not like bad. That's just data are inconclusive over there. The gray matter volume sort of throughout, right? There are areas in which white matter volume are increased. There are areas in which perfusion has been shown uh, to increase. And then the actual neural activity uh, increases throughout it. Uh, so the, the changes as we get into, you know, the moving into acute, um, the function is uh, a product of the neural activity and uh, it's, it's dependent on the task or whether you're at rest, it's all improved. Um, but in acute aerobic exercise, the communication between brain regions, so acute functioning, um, a single bout of exercise is sufficient to do that, um, to change the function, but not really the architecture. So this is that same diagram we looked at earlier for chronic, but for acute. Uh, notice IGF isn't on there. IGF improves with acute bouts of exercise, but it depends. Who are we looking at? What's the context? What's the environment? What, what are the characteristics of exercise? What's the intensity of exercise? IGF is varied uh, in its response, and so it's varied in the literature. But VEGF and, and BDNF, let's go do some aerobic exercise, and you see pretty reliable effects with those. Um, cerebral blood flow, neurotransmitter concentration, that's what the NT is, glucose and oxygen metabolism, all of that stuff increases. And so improved cognition, improved motor performance, or motor performance, most of that is coming from the brain. Primary motor cortex, cerebellum, really heavy areas for, for motor control. And so we do become uh, better athletes with brain improvement. And again, same diagram, but this is acute exercise, all these different brain regions, um, the confusion changes, glucose metabolism, um, it has been demonstrated to, to improve pretty much throughout, you know, a little bit of oxygen metabolism, um, receptor activity. Uh, so there are acute changes, but they aren't architecture. But if you repeat acute exercise over and over and over, it becomes chronic. So if you're gonna get BDNF and IGF, BEGF released over and over and over, they will elicit that chronic effect, that architectural change. Now, using your acute exercise effectively, employing acute bounce of conditioning to have an effect. Um, the, the goal in, in most literature is how do we get the most BDNF possible? What is the prescription of exercise? that elicits the biggest BDNF response. Sometimes they're looking at cognition or memory or some sort of you know, performance on a task. But commonly is how much BDNF uh, uh, can we get? And if you want to look at the mechanisms, this is the best article that just goes through the mechanisms. It's not gonna be on the exam. You don't need to know, you're not accountable for knowing the stuff. Really good article though, you can pull it up later, uh, it'll be there for the mechanisms of neuroplasticity. And again, good neuroplasticity, that's what we're after. Bad neuroplasticity is trauma. And it's, oh, we, we're, we respond so excessively to 
uh, emotional or physical trauma. And the neuroplasticity is pretty immediate and, and huge. Uh, but we want good neuroplasticity. We want better improvement. Uh, we want to never yield to, to cognitive decline. We want to uh, be able to be at our sharpest and, and have intact memories. And that's good uh, neuroplasticity. Uh, now, resistance training is studied less than aerobic conditioning. Aerobic studies, oh, there's like, you know, over 100 of these things. I mean, just study after study after study on aerobic conditioning and uh, BDNF. <clears throat> With uh, resistance training, there are some. This is a 2017 meta-analysis. I think there were eight. Um, so they looked at specific uh, studies. So there, there are exclusionary criteria in, in, their, in their study selection. But uh, eight of the 55 studies were resistance training, and it works. Resistance training improves BDNF2 uh, according to the state of evidence, but the evidence is flimsier than it is for aerobic conditioning. For aerobic metabolism, study after study after study, you're seeing a consistent effect. For resistance training, there isn't that much. Uh, now, this is a resistance training study that wasn't in that meta-analysis, and looking at older adults, works for older adults too. And the intensity didn't seem to matter. Uh, for older adults doing resistance training, cognition was improved and intensity was sort of irrelevant. That doesn't mean that intensity is totally irrelevant. It is one of the primary determinants in most studies, but sometimes in some conditions, in some populations, in some characteristics of exercise, Intensity, uh, intensity doesn't matter that much. So the Stroop test, um, if, if you can read those, those words, how fast can you get through those without messing up? Uh, but yeah, so if you were to either state the um, color or read the word or do you know any of these things, stating the color gets really hard. Yeah, red, black, or I guess if you blur, blur your eyes or you know, um, color blindness is an advantage in this in this situation. But um, so this is the strip test, and what they had was four different groups, and they were doing the strip test. Uh, one of them was a non-exercise group. Uh, the other one was a really high intensity resistance training uh, group, 80% of the one RM, one repetition max, so let's do 80% of that weight. Uh, and then there was a combined moderate intensity, some aerobic, some resistance, and then there's a really high intensity aerobic. So high intensity aerobic, high intensity resistance, nothing, or moderate of both. And the moderate group uh, performed the best. The moderate group was best here for aerobic and uh, resistance training uh, combined. So there are some studies that indicate exercise is exercise and it's good. It's aerobic, it's resistance, the intensity doesn't have to be nutty. Uh, most work indicates intensity is one of the primary determinants of the response. Uh, so this is one, it's a 2007, pretty early study um, that didn't find uh, duration really to matter, right? In this cohort, so there's um, just under 2,000 people. In this cohort, uh, there were no significant associations between the total time spent on activities and, and cognition, but the intensity, the intensity of weekly physical activities matter. This is a common uh, finding. This is another one, this is in 2019, and this is a rat study. Um, but again, we're finding whether it's animal models or human models, exercise intensity seems to be one of the primary uh, determinants of elevations in BDF, BDNF and the subsequent alterations in both performance and um, uh, you know, brain architecture, uh, neurogenesis, mapogenesis. Coordination is another component of exercise that seems to matter again and again in the literature. So if you get on the recumbent bike, and you close your eyes, 
you go intensely, but you just do this, and okay? it's just you're not at risk of falling off. There's no coordination. You're not also juggling at the same time. Uh, you're not going to get as pronounced of an effect. Incorporating some coordination gives us uh, a better response with uh, BDNF and uh, cognition and all these effects that come through it. So <clears throat> the types of exercise that elicit the most pronounced effect would be tennis is sort of a famous one. There's an aerobic demand. There's an exertion, but there's also coordination. There's coordination involved um, you know, just hand-eye coordination and where you are on the cords and proprioception. A lot of that is being challenged simultaneously. Dancing uh, would be another one. Um, go do, go run on the levee, but like, you know, do like little, little like, you know, dance moves as you go. You'll fit stocking, you'll fit in. Um, half the people up there are on, you know, something. Shrooms or math or something. Um, so you'll blend right in. But if you, know, if you do some sort of obstacle core or something like that, that seems uh, to work better. And going one step uh, further, if you include a cognitive task at the same time. So there's the physical exhaustion piece, whether it's aerobic or resistance training, a physical exhaustion piece. There's the coordination, the motor learning part. And then there's the cognition that you can do also. You know, count backwards from, you know, do the alphabet backwards. Can anybody, did anybody ever like memorize that in case you were like pull over? Um, so it becomes hard. It, it'd be like, all right, Z, Y, X, I do a W, and then I don't know, think. <clears throat> and so if you do that and you have to start thinking <clears throat> while you're playing tennis, you're going to get a, a bigger effect. Uh, so this, there's a couple of good diagrams in this study. And what they show is you have strength training and aerobic conditioning. That's the physical training part, right? This is that your body is being depleted and exhausted and you're, you're, you're working your meat. On this side, you know, balance and coordination, maybe flexibility, but balance and coordination. Uh, that's the motor training over here. Uh, but then also the dual task. So the specific skills in the middle, um, you know, you might have tennis, something like that in, in the middle. Um, water polo would, would, would go in the middle. I mean, if you just like relax, and like sink and lose. And so there's a lot of exertion, but there's also a lot of motor coordination. Those activities are better than running on a treadmill. Those activities are better than simply going to the gym and lifting weights. If you can do a motor slash physical training, but if you also include some sort of cognitive training, that seems to give you uh, to elicit the, the most neuroplasticity, the most adaptation. Uh, is, there, is it possible if you like the cognitive intensive task, that you would cost the brain? Yes. Uh, really good question. So, performance, the brain performance and the body performance really are connected. And one of the best experiments I know actually goes the other way around where they had these, these groups and one of them um, relaxed. They watched videos about like the Orient Express cars and whatever. And like, they watched videos about like locomotive stuff and they just kind of sat there and relaxed. The other group did this really mentally exhausting uh, exercise for a while. And then they had them do physical exercise. And the mentally exhausted group, they didn't have it in them. They couldn't do it. And so uh, mental exhaustion compromises physical performance. Uh, I'm, I'm less familiar with the literature the other way around, but there's no way it's not true. <laughs> so your question is a very valid one. Uh, matters of magnitude. Uh, I can't comment on how exhausted the brain will become if you really overdo it. Uh, and I think there's a lot of individuality too. Some people are enlivened by a brief bout of exercise and other people just like need to take a nap afterwards. So uh, figuring out the individuality piece first. Uh, but yeah, really good question. I wish I had a better answer for you um, other than to nod about the question.
question and you're, and you're thinking. Oh, the duration. So this is a 2019 study saying durations of the Don't necessarily like that. It doesn't matter in some particular studies. Uh, 20 minutes was sufficient. And that they're going through the state of evidence. 20 minutes was sufficient to elicit uh, the you know, BDNF and IGF responses. If you extend it to 30 minutes, if you extend it to 40 minutes, there wasn't a supplemental advantage. Uh, you know, 40 minutes, look at the BDNF, 20 minutes, uh, same as 30, same as 40. There's plenty of work that says that. We also, if you're right in the world a couple of years, a meta-analysis uh, showed that longer duration was helpful. So intensity is nearly unanimously, it's not unanimous, intensity is, but it's nearly unanimous. Intensity is almost always demonstrated as being very important to the cognitive effects of all. Duration, I don't know, some studies say it works, some studies say it doesn't. Most studies agree that 20 minutes is totally sufficient. Less than 20 minutes is sufficient, especially if you have that intensity. But it, again, it depends on the population. <laughs> we'll talk about males and females and, and uh, you know, ovulations. But, you know, there, there are periods of the month where, where females are more or less responsive to neuroplasticity. Uh, older and younger populations, trained and untrained populations, the environment you're exercising, and all that stuff matters. And so it's no surprise that the literature is uh, discrepant. Intensity seems to be very important. Duration, sometimes it's found to be important. Heat also. Now, if you want to lose body fat, don't exercise in the heat. You're just very glycolytic. If you want BDNF, there's some evidence that heat enhances the BDNF response. But here's two different articles with two different findings. Uh, this first one, the exercise-induced uh, increase in peripheral BDNF seems to be related to a corresponding increase in core temperature at different time points. Um, this isn't the only article that says that. This is just one of them. But down here, there was not an effective temperature on BDNF in the current study. Um, and then a partial sentence after that. Uh, so it is mixed in the literature. Other studies have found this, other studies have found that. However, let's get out of exercise completely and just look at heat by itself. No exercise, get in a hot tub, like a super hot hot tub. Uh, it's like 107 degrees, this, this hot tub. Uh, and so, I mean, the other one is 35 Celsius. That, that's not too cold either, like 95. Uh, but 42 Celsius, that's really hot. So this isn't comfortable. This is fit for 20 minutes in what feels like the opposite of an ice bath. 107, that's, that's not cozy. In 20 minutes, that's a heat stress. And when you see the core temperature increase in these people, you know, the immersion, you see the core temperature increase, you see BDNF increase. Sorry, the heat that we're like, Heat can be super negative if it's yeah to excess. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, like in these studies, they could ever like, oh, it's increased to those normal. I it's a it's pretty. So this is a 2018 study, and this is a topic that's not quite settled yet. Um, so I don't think that answer has really emerged in terms of the heat was too much. Now. Um, nobody real. I mean, the, on average, people went up. These these little black dots. These are the hot folks. Um, the white dots. Those are the controls. And the, the heat stress group. It lasts for a little while. You know, thirty minutes after, you still have a um, an effect in, in some of them. I get individuality. It's not like everybody does this. You know, there's a, there's a, um, a spread. There's a there's a bell curve wherever you. And uh, but I don't know the answer to how much heat do we see like everything uh, tapering. I, I haven't seen that one either. Now let's get back to uh, Garrett Ash's hand grip study. That was for blood pressure, but this is a hand grip study. It's 2017, a relatively new topic. But where our BDNF comes from, about 99% of it of the circulating BDNF, uh, BDNF is bound to platelets. 
And how do we get uh, the spleen to spit out some of that stuff? About 30% of our circulating platelets are stored in the spleen. How do we get to, to start spitting out those platelets and get that BD and F response? Hand grip works. Now there are a couple of different uh, procedures. There are a couple of different groups. There was a moderate intensity group and a high intensity group. The maximal uh, intensity protocol was 10 minutes and the moderate intensity, I think it was 20 minutes. But what they would do in this maximal intensity uh, group is they would do maximum hand grip, uh, hold it for two seconds, relax for a couple seconds, squeeze for two seconds, relax for, a couple, for 10 minutes. And they got a pronounced beating up response with hand grip. So the intensity doesn't have to be huge muscle groups involving your lungs and heart, even your forearm. You can get a BDNF response uh, from your forearm. And the more intense group, despite being a shorter uh, exercise, despite being a shorter period, P was 0.06, uh, compelling, but you know, Ronald Fisher said 05, so uh, statisticians worldwide say 0.05 is, is a cutoff because Ronald Fisher said it. And he's like the smartest uh, statistician who's ever lived. <clears throat> so, but the, the intensity, even though it was half the time, elicited a bigger beating up response. It's just more on. Now getting into men and women, there are studies, there's plenty of, of data that talk about uh, females having better uptake of BDNF, uh, especially when estradiol is, is higher. So, you know, during ovulation. And um, that estradiol and the progesterone seem to augment synaptogenesis and BDNF expression. And uh, you know, a lot of evidence about females having an advantage in, in, in neuroplasticity, exercise induced neuroplasticity. However, uh, this is a, going back to that 2017 meta analysis. Uh, this one found in the studies they chose, in the studies that made it in, uh, they found males that have uh, a better response, uh, a BDNF response, a more pronounced uh, BDNF response following exercise. It depends who you're looking at. The studies they chose was 75% males. Um, it, again, it depends on the exercise conditions. It depends on the time of the month. It depends on the environment. There are so many variables. Uh, my hunch is at some point we'll have an answer and and contextually males and females thrive in, in slightly different scenarios that's my hunch but we have to wait until the literature uh, sorts it out but any age any fitness level you can get a response there's no too late to get started on neuroplasticity on um, fending off cognitive decline on restructuring your your brain improving your function there's no too late and it's like well i'm 70 i've never exercised before but it can start because you will get an effect and that effect will get better and better with successive exercise sessions are we okay with the exercise part the behavioral exercise part uh let's do nootropics <clears throat> dictionary.com slash e slash slang slash nootropics <clears throat> so it's just it's it's been around forever. Neutropics is a word that nobody really heard until a few years ago when it became really popular. Uh, but it just means like to bend or to turn the mind neutropic toward or to bend or uh, the mind. So there's a lot of these. And there's a lot, pretty much anything you take is going to affect your neurons somehow. I don't care what it is. It's salt. Take a handful of salt. And you're going to affect blood flow. Anything you put in your mouth, you're going to have some sort of effect. That said, effects that are consistent and substantial and can be used effectively. Alcohol is one of them, but I don't think people use it effectively. Uh, small doses, uh, control small doses, and you can get this acute dopamine and testosterone response increasing uh, both of those with alcohol. 
So alcohol can be a nootropic, an ergogenic aid and a nootropic if used with an appropriate dose, not used like a fraternity. Uh, we all know caffeine, methyl xanthine is the class that caffeine uh, falls in, along with uh, like theobromine. Um, that's the one that's the, the more famous one, chocolate. Theophylline also, super old drug. Uh, so these have a lot of effects, and caffeine tends to work better in pill form or powder or whatever, in non-coffee form. Caffeine tends to, to work a little bit better. Uh, but its major effect on cognition is going to be the inhibition of adenosine binding in the brain. Uh, adenosine is going to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate, and that's sleep pressure. That is the idea of, 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 you know, you get later and later and later in the day and you're getting a little bit uh, sleepier and sleepier and sleepier. Your adenosine is building and building and building. Um, this is an adenosine inhibitor. Uh, and so that's a lot of its uh, function. But it also has very diverse effects you know, with dopamine. And uh, so th there, there's a ton of, of additional effects with caffeine. And there's a million articles you go to. I just put one uh, there. Now, what you won't get from the coffee, from your cup of coffee, or you just eat the whole, you know, coffee beans and you won't get it either. What's in the berry, um, sometimes, you know, the cherry or the coffee fruit, you can get this as a supplement. And I take this, uh, but you, the, the, the coffee fruit as a supplement. And there are several studies that show it increases in BDNF with coffee fruit. And I'm unaware of there being any potential complication or side effect. Now, anything that you eat in a huge dose, water, you can die from water, right? Drink too much water, death will surely uh, uh, follow. So with all of it, just like with alcohol, like a tiny dose of alcohol, and you might get a dopamine or testosterone response, a huge dose of alcohol, and you're in the hospital, all right? Or at least you're super hungover the next day. Um, so I'm not in these slides, I'm not putting on doses to take, I'm not putting on, you know, there's no prescription here, but this is just the common nootropics uh, that you see, the common nootropics you've probably heard of. Uh, Phosphatalserine, I take this one too. Um, white and gray matter both, this is a major component. And uh, it's been around for me. I mean, I started taking Phosphatalserine when I was a teenager, I'm 41. I was saying this is a teenager. I think I was 19 when I got it. Now it was, I was taking it for bodybuilding at the time, going to a cut phase and it's a very stressful time and, and, uh, and looking at the, the tapering of, of those cortisol spikes. But when you start looking at cognitive decline um, and patients taking phosphatalserine, so many studies on improved cognition. It's, I've, I've taken this forever, it's, it's not new. Uh, and this is a good article just talking about the of the breadth of phosphatalserine. Uh, phosphatalcholine, sure, get that too. I, I didn't put it in here. Uh, blueberry, you can either just eat blueberries like a human being, uh, or you can get capsules of the, the flavonoids and the extract, things like that. So in, the, in blueberry, there are a lot of anti-inflammatory properties and associated cognition with that. <sighs> anti-inflammatory and uh, antioxidant as well. In addition, and all of these articles, so they'll be in a, I'll put them in a separate file where if you download the zip file, I'll have a nootropic file folder uh, that I'll put in there uh, that has all of these nootropic articles. Um, so the anti-inflammatory and cognition, but also uh, with, with blueberry, uh, BDNF and um, uh, learning, uh, that long-term potentiation, the, the, uh, the learning. Uh, Possibly consequent from the anti inflammatory and the BDNF. You know, it's hard to have correlations be, be more than correlations. But uh, nicotine, obviously, nicotine has to be in there. Why do people smoke? Because it like feels awesome with the dopamine. Okay, so, so cigarettes or you know, cigarette gum or a patch or whatever, uh, the dopamine release and improved cognition. Both of those. Just you know, these. these of serial smokers and the serial caffeine uh, uh, consumers, there's a positive effect that you get from it. 
So uh, nicotine does work really well. Does it have side effects? Yes, it has side effects, but it's also effective uh, as a nootropic. Lion's mane, I've never done this one. Probably yes, but, uh, but the nerve growth factor mRNA, there's more of that. There's some evidence on nerve regeneration, peripheral nerve regeneration, and on uh, prevention of cognitive decline. So lion's mane does have data behind it. Back a little. It's not one that I'm going to add to my, you know, supplement cabinet, but uh, but it's a popular one, and there there is literature uh, behind it. Uh, ginkgo biloba. I don't take this one either, but there's a ton of uh, studies on ginkgo biloba, and one of them is dopamine. Um, but they've also found neurogenesis, so both dopamine and neurogenesis. Most of the work on ginkgo biloba is on neural protection. So if you're going to have um, a transient ischemic attack or, or um, a, a, sorry, either a temporary uh, or a stroke, um, cerebrovascular accident, ginkgo biloba seems to be uh, neural protective in those, in those situations. So to, to uh, make ischemia less devastating. So ginkgo biloba, there's a ton of studies on, on that. Now, that's not where the list ends. Those are some of the very common ones that tons of people take. There are slightly less common ones um, that fewer people take. And um, plenty of evidence on these. Every single one of these uh, nootropics on the board, this isn't the complete list. This is a partial playing field of the nootropics that are out there. And every single one of these has studies to support its effect, these particular effects, whether it's dopamine or neuroprotection or you know, learning and memory, uh, nerve growth factor, BDNF, um, all of these, you know, cerebral glucose and oxygen uptake, there are studies to support all of those. Um, what I would encourage you to do is if you want to start experimenting, to read the studies first. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down to, to GNC. Does that exist or does that collapse in quarantine? It still exists. Yeah, I wouldn't go down to, to GNC to just buy them all and start eating them and see what happens. Uh, I would always do one at a time and read the literature first. Don't take the, like the salesman's word for it. He's just trying to upsell. Oh, you also want this. You're, you're here for lion's mane. Oh, let me tell you what you need. And then just take like nine of these things too. A lot of them overlap in their, in their mechanism. Um, people respond to supplements differently. So that's it for our, does anybody want to take a picture? I'll put that, I'll put this in the, in the review slides so you can see um, the complete list uh, of the stuff also. Um, I got to the computer in. You can eat in the heat for 20 minutes at 107 degrees Fahrenheit will become a therapeutic kind of remedy for neuroplasticity for people, for older adults. Or would that would the heat just be too much for the older adults? Say that again. I was I was worried my computer was gonna die. Uh, <laughs> so, say that. so I was listening a year ago to a podcast about a woman who talked about how boxers are starting to do more heat stress. Um, after their exercise to increase okay. BDNF in their brains because they're repeatedly hit over time in the head. Yeah. So do you think that will become a therapeutic effect for like athletes who are hit over the repeatedly over the head, like football with CTE, or also in like older adults who are starting to get Alzheimer's, dementia, they I think so. apply the heat as a therapeutic um, effect? Yeah, I really like the question. Uh, all I have is a hunch, and my hunch is Yes, I think the data need to be sorted yeah. out a little bit more about dosing and um, potential other effects on recovery, you know, whether it's an inflammatory uh, response. Or I think there's a lot that needs to be settled before we can start prescribe it to people. Uh, but it's totally reasonable. Yeah. 
Other questions? Is there like a, a, a recovery time of somebody said after like six minutes of exercise, uh, like people are like were able to retain what they learned better? Uh, like, is there, do they have to know what that test with the seven minute run? Uh, like, are those run seven minutes and then before going to their class, are they supposed to? Yeah, you straight to class and are they good to start learning? Or yeah, they're good to start learning during exercise when you're exerting. Um, I've seen some work that says, you know, shunting of blood around particular areas, that might not be the optimal time to do uh, difficult, like, challenging learning. Like when you're, you're breathing heavily and exhausting, now I'm trying to memorize it. That's probably not the right time. But immediately after exercise, um, when blood is doing what it's supposed to, and you have this surge of uh, neurotrophins, that's the optimal time to learn. So go do your exertion, and then right after, just sit down, you know, catch your breath. Oh, shit, they did die. Um, let me stop the recording. <laughs>